Part the Second, The Banquet, Section One, of Thais by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Banquet, Section One. When, followed by Paphnutius, Thais entered the banqueting room, the guests were already, for the most part, assembled and reclining on their couches before the horseshoe table, which was covered with glittering vessels. In the center of the table stood a silver basin, surmounted by four figures of satyrs who poured out from wineskins on the boiled fish a kind of pickle in which they floated. When Thais appeared, acclamations arose from all sides. Greetings to the sister of the graces, to the silent Melpomene who can express all things with her looks, salutation to the well-beloved of gods and men, to the much-desired, to her who gives suffering and its cure, to the pearl of Rakotis, to the rose of Alexandria. She waited impatiently till this torrent of praise had passed, and then said to Cotta, the host, Lucius, I have brought you a monk of the desert, Paphnutius, the abbot of Antinoe. He is a great saint, whose words burn like fire. Lucius Aurelius Cotta, the prefect of the fleet, rose and replied, you are welcome, Paphnutius, you who profess the Christian faith. I myself have some respect of a religion that has now become imperial. The divine Constantine has placed your co-religionists in the front rank of the friends of the empire. Latin wisdom ought, in fact, to admit your Christ into our pantheon. It was a maxim of our forefathers that there was something divine in every god. But no more of that. Let us drink and enjoy ourselves while there is yet time. Old Cotta spoke tranquilly. He had just studied a new model for a galley and had finished the sixth book of his history of the Carthaginians. He felt sure he had not lost his day and was satisfied with himself and the gods. Paphnutius, he added, you see here several men who are worthy to be loved, Hermodorus, the high priest of Serapis, the philosophers Dorian, Nicias, and Xenothemus, the poet Callicrates, young Charius, and young Aristobulus, both sons of dear old comrades, and near them Philina and Drosia, who deserve to be praised for their beauty. Nicias embraced Paphnutius and whispered in his ear, I warned you, brother, that Venus was powerful. It is her gentle force that has brought you here in spite of yourself. Listen, you are a man full of piety, but if you do not confess that she is the mother of the gods, your ruin is certain. Do you know that the old mathematician Melenthes used to say, I cannot demonstrate the properties of a triangle without the aid of Venus. Dorian, who for some seconds had been looking at the newcomer, suddenly clapped his hands and uttered a cry of surprise. It is he, friends, his look, his beard, his tunic. It is he himself. I met him at the theater while Sir Thais was acting. He was furiously excited and spoke with violence, as I can testify. He is an honest man, but he will abuse us all. His eloquence is terrible. If Marcus is the Plato of the Christians, Paphnutius is the Demosthenes. Epicurus in his little garden never heard the like. Philina and Drosia, however, devoured Thais with their eyes. She wore in her fair hair a wreath of pale violets, each color of which recalled, in a paler hue, the color of her eyes, so that the flowers looked like softened glances, and the eyes like sparkling flowers. It was the peculiar gift of this woman. On her everything lived, and was soul and harmony. Her robe, which was of mauve spangled with silver, trailed in long folds with a grace that was almost melancholy, and was not relieved by either bracelets or necklaces. The chief charm of her appearance was her beautiful bare arms, 
the two friends were obliged to admire, in spite of themselves, the robe and headdress of Thais, though they said nothing to her on the subject. "'How beautiful you are!' said Felina. "'You could not have been more so when you came to Alexandria. Yet my mother, who remembers seeing you then, says there were few women who were worthy to be compared with you.' "'Who is the new lover you have brought?' asked Drosia. He has a strange, wild appearance. If there are shepherds of elephants, assuredly he must resemble one. Where did you find such a wild-looking friend, Thais? Was it among the troglodytes who live under the earth and are grimy with the smoke of Hades? But Felina put her finger on Drosia's lips. Hush! The mysteries of love must remain secret, and it is forbidden to know them. For my own part, certainly... I would rather be kissed by the mouth of a smoking Etna than by the lips of that man. But our dear Thais, who is beautiful and adorable as the goddess, should, like the goddess, grant all requests, and not like us, only those of nice young men. Take care, both of you, replied Thais. He is a mage and an enchanter. He hears words that are whispered, and even thoughts. He will tear out your heart while you are asleep and put a sponge in its place, and the next day, when you drink water, you will be choked to death. She watched them grow pale, and then she turned away from them and sat on a couch by the side of Paphnutius. The voice of Cotta, kind but imperious, was suddenly heard above the murmur of conversation. Friends, let each of us take his place. "'Slaves, pour out the honeyed wine!' And then the host, raising his cup, "'Let us first drink to the divine Constantine "'and the genius of the empire. "'The country should be first of all, "'even above the gods, for it contains them all.' All the guests raised their full cups to their lips. Paphnutius alone did not drink "'because Constantine had persecuted the Nicene faith "'and because the country of the Christian.' is not of this world. Dorian, having drunk, murmured, Oh, what is one's country? A flowing river. The shores change and the waves are incessantly renewed. I know, Dorian, replied the prefect of the fleet, that you care little for the civic virtues, and you think that the sage ought to hold himself aloof from all affairs. I think, on the contrary, that an honest man should desire nothing better than to fill a responsible post in the state. The state is a noble thing. Hermodorus, the high priest of Serapis, spoke next. Dorian has asked, What is one's country? I will reply that the altars of the gods and the tombs of the ancestors make one's country. A man is a fellow citizen by association of memories and hopes. Young Aristobulus interrupted Hermodorus. By Castor, I saw a splendid horse today. It belonged to Demophon. It has a fine head, a small jaw and strong forelegs. It carries its high neck and proud like a cock. But young Chariot shook his head. It is not such a good horse as you say, Aristobulus. Its hoofs are thin, and its pasterns are too low. The animal will soon go lame. They were continuing their dispute when Drosia uttered a piercing shriek. Oh, I nearly swallowed a fishbone, as long and much sharper than a style. Luckily, I was able to get it out of my throat in time. The gods love me. Did you say, Drosia, that the gods loved you? asked Nicias, smiling. Then they must share the same infirmities as men. Love presupposes unhappiness on the part of whoever suffers from it. And here is a proof of weakness. The affection they feel for Drosia is a great proof of the imperfection of the gods. At these words, Drosia flew into a great rage. Nicias, your remarks are foolish and not to the point. But that's your character. You never understand what is said, and reply in words devoid of sense. Nicias smiled again. Talk away, talk away, Drosia. 
whatever you say. We are glad every time you open your mouth. Your teeth are so pretty. At that moment, the grave-looking old man, negligently dressed, walking slowly with head high, entered the room and gazed at the guests quietly. Cotta made a sign to him to take a place by his side, on the same couch. Oikrates, he said, you are welcome. Have you composed a new treatise on philosophy this month? That would make, if I calculate correctly, the ninety-second that has proceeded from the Nile reed you direct with an attic hand. Oikrates replied, stroking his silver beard, the nightingale was created to sing, and I was created to praise the immortal gods. Dorian. Let us respectfully salute in Oikrates the last of the Stoics. Grave and white he stands in the midst of us like the image of an ancestor. He is solitary amidst a crowd of men, and the words he utters are not heard. Oikrates. You deceive yourself, Dorian. The philosophy of virtue is not dead. I have numerous disciples in Alexandria, Rome, and Constantinople. Many of the slaves and some of the nephews of Caesar now know how to govern themselves, to live independently, and, being unconcerned with all affairs, they enjoy boundless happiness. Many of them have revived in their own person. Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. But if it were true that virtue were forever extinguished upon the earth, in what way would the loss of it affect my happiness, since it did not depend on me whether it existed or perished? Only fools, Dorian, place their happiness out of their own power. I desire nothing that the gods do not wish, and I desire all that they do wish. By that means, I render myself like unto them, and I share their infallible content. If virtue perishes, I consent that it should perish, and that consent fills me with joy as the supreme effort of my reason or my courage. In all things, my wisdom will copy the divine wisdom, and the copy will be more valuable than the model. It will have cost greater care and more work. Nicias, I understand. You put yourself on the same level as divine providence. But if virtue consists only in effort, Eucrates, and in that intense application by which the disciples of Zeno pretend to render themselves equal to the gods, the frog which swelled itself out to try to become as big as an ox accomplished a masterpiece of Stoicism. Eucrates, you jest, Nicias, and, as usual, you excel in ridicule. But if the ox of which you speak is really a god, like Apis, or like that subterranean ox whose high priest I see here, and if the frog, being wisely inspired, succeeded in equaling it, would it not be, in fact, more virtuous than the ox? And could you refrain from admiring such a courageous little animal? Four servants placed on the table a wild pig, still covered with its bristles. Little pigs, made of pastry, surrounded the animal as though they would suckle, to show that it was a sow. Xenothemus, turning towards the monk, said, Friends, a guest has come hither to join us, the illustrious Puffnutius, who leads such an extraordinary life of solitude, is our unexpected guest. Cotta. You may even add, Xenothemis, that the place of honor is due to him, because he came without being invited. Xenothemis. Therefore we ought, my dear Lucius, to make him the more welcome, and to strive to do that which would be most agreeable to him. Now it is certain that such a man cares less for the perfumes of meat than for the perfumes of fine thoughts. We shall doubtless please him by discussing the doctrine he professes, which is that of Jesus crucified. For my own part, I shall the more willingly discuss this doctrine, because it keenly interests me, 
on account of the number and the diversity of the allegories it contains. If one may guess at the spirit by the letter, it is filled with truths, and I consider that the Christian books abound in divine revelations. But I should not, Paphnutius, grant equal merit to the Jewish books. They were inspired not, as it was said, by the Spirit of God, but by an evil genius. Yahweh, who dictated them, was one of those spirits who people the lower air and cause the greater part of the evils from which we all suffer. But he surpassed all others in ignorance and ferocity. On the contrary, the serpent with golden wings, which twined its azure coils around the tree of knowledge, was made up of light and love. A combat between these two powers, the one of light and the other of darkness, was therefore inevitable. It occurred soon after the creation of the world. God had hardly begun to rest after his labors. Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, lived happy and naked in the Garden of Eden. When Yahweh conceived, to their misfortune, the design of governing them and all the generations which Eve already bore in her splendid loins. As he possessed neither the compass nor the lyre, and was equally ignorant of the science which commands and the art which persuades, he frightened these two poor children by hideous apparitions, capricious threats, and thunderbolts. Adam and Eve, feeling his shadow upon them, pressed closer to one another, and their love waxed stronger in fear. The serpent took pity on them, and determined to instruct them, in order that, possessing knowledge, they might no longer be misled by lies. Such an undertaking required extreme prudence, and the frailty of the first human couple rendered it almost hopeless. The well-intentioned demon essayed it, however. Without the knowledge of Yahweh, who pretended to see everything, but in reality was not very sharp-sighted, he approached these two beings and charmed their eyes by the splendor of his coat and the brilliancy of his wings. Then he interested their minds by forming before them, with his body, definite figures, such as the circle, the ellipse, and the spiral, the wonderful properties of which since have been recognized by the Greeks. Adam meditated on these figures more than Eve did, but when the serpent began to speak and taught the most sublime truths, those which cannot be demonstrated, he found that Adam, being made of red earth, was of too dull a nature to understand these subtle distinctions, but that Eve, on the contrary, being more tender and more sensitive, was easily impressed. Therefore, he conversed with her alone, in the absence of her husband, in order to initiate her first Dorian. Permit me, Xenothemus, to interrupt you, I speedily recognize that in the myth you have explained to us an episode in the war of Pallas Athene against the giants. Yahweh much resembles Typhoon, and Pallas is represented by the Athenians with a serpent at her side. But what you have said causes me to considerable doubt as to the intelligence or good faith of the serpent of whom you have spoken. If he had really possessed knowledge... Would he have entrusted it to a woman's little head, which was incapable of containing it? I should rather consider that he was like Yahweh, ignorant and a liar, and that he chose Eve because she was easily seduced, and he imagined that Adam would have more intelligence and perception. Xenothemus Learn, Dorian, that it is not by perception and intelligence, but by sensibility that the highest and purest truths are reached. And that is why women, who are generally less reflective but more sensitive than men, rise more easily to the knowledge of things divine. In them is the gift of prophecy, and it is not without reason that Apollo, Scytherides, and Jesus of Nazareth are sometimes represented clad, like women, in flowing robes. 
The initiator was therefore wise. Whatever you may say to the contrary, Dorian, in bestowing light not on the duller Adam, but on Eve, who was whiter than milk, or the stars. She freely listened to him, and allowed herself to be led to the tree of knowledge, the branches of which rose to heaven, and which was bathed with the divine spirit as with a dew. This tree was covered with leaves which spoke all the languages of future races of men, and their united voices formed a perfect harmony. Its abundant fruit gave to the initiated who tasted it the knowledge of metals, stones, and plants, and also of physical and moral laws. But this fruit was like fire, and those who feared suffering and death did not dare put it to their lips. Now, as she had listened attentively to the lessons of the serpent, Eve despised these empty terrors, and wished to taste the fruit which gave the knowledge of God. But, as she loved Adam, and did not wish him to be inferior to her, she took him by the hand and led him to the wonderful tree. Then she picked one of the burning apples, bit it, and proffered it to her companion. Unfortunately, Yahweh, who was by chance walking in the garden, surprised them, and seeing that they had become wise, he fell into a most ungovernable rage. It is in his jealous fits that he is most to be feared. Assembling all his forces, he created such a turmoil in the lower air that these two weak beings were terrified. The fruit fell from the man's hand, and the woman, clinging to the neck of her luckless husband, said, I too will be ignorant and suffer with him. The triumphant Yahweh kept Adam and Eve and all their seed in a condition of habitude and terror. His art, which consisted only in being able to make huge meteors, triumphed over the science of the serpent, who was a musician and geometrician. He made men unjust, ignorant and cruel, and caused evil to reign in the earth. He persecuted Cain and his sons because they were skillful workmen. He exterminated the Philistines because they composed Orphic poems and fables like those of Aesop. He was the implacable enemy of science and beauty, and for long ages the human race expiated in blood and tears the defeat of the winged serpent. Fortunately, there arose among the Greeks learned men, such as Pythagoras and Plato, who recovered by the force of genius the figures and the ideas which the enemy of Yahweh had vainly tried to teach the first woman. The soul of the serpent was in them, and that is why the serpent, as Dorian has said, is honored by the Athenians. Finally, in these latter days, there appeared under human form three celestial spirits, Jesus of Galilee, Basilides, and Valentinus, to whom it was given to pluck the finest fruits of that tree of knowledge, whose roots pass through all the earth, and whose top reaches to the highest heaven. I have said all this in vindication of the Christians, to whom the errors of the Jews are too often imputed. Dorian. If I understood you aright, Xenothemus, you said that three wonderful men, uh, Jesus, Basilides, and Valentinus, had discovered the secrets which had remained hidden from Pythagoras and Plato, and all the philosophers of Greece, and even from the divine Epicurus, who, however, has freed men from the dread of empty terrors. You would greatly oblige me by telling me by what means these three mortals acquired knowledge, which had eluded the most contemplative sages. Xenothemus. Must I repeat to you, Dorian, that science and cogitation are but the first steps to knowledge, 
and that ecstasy alone leads to eternal truth? Hermodorus. It is true, Xenothemus, that the soul is nourished on ecstasy, as the cicada is nourished on dew. But we may even say more. The mind alone is capable of perfect rapture. For man is of a threefold nature, composed of material body, of a soul which is more subtle, but also material, and of an incorruptible mind. When emerging from the body, as from a palace, suddenly given over to silence and solitude, and flying through the gardens of the soul, the mind diffuses itself in God, it tastes the delights of an anticipated death, or rather of a future life, for to die is to live, and in that condition, partaking of divine purity, it possesses both infinite joy and complete knowledge. It enters into the unity which is all. It is perfected. Nicias. That is very fine, but to say the truth, Hermodorus, I do not see much difference between all and nothing. Her words even seem to fail to make the distinction. Infinity is terribly like nothingness. They are both inconceivable to the mind. In my opinion, perfection costs too dear. We pay for it with all our being, and to possess it must cease to exist. That is a calamity from which God himself is not free, for the philosophers are doing their best to perfect him. After all, if we do not know what it is not to be, we are equally ignorant of what it is to be. We know nothing. It is said that it is impossible for men to agree on this question. I believe, in spite of our noisy disputes, that it is, on the contrary, impossible for men not to become some day all at unity buried under the mass of contradictions a pelion and ossa which they themselves have raised cotta i am very fond of philosophy and study it in my leisure time but i never understand it well except in cicero's books slaves pour out the honeyed wine Calocrates. It is a singular thing, but when I am hungry, I think of the time when the tragic poets sat at the boards of good tyrants, and my mouth waters. But when I have tasted the excellent wine that you had give us so abundantly, generous Lucius, I dream of nothing but civil wars and heroic combats. I blush to live in such inglorious times. I invoke the goddess of liberty, and I pour out my blood in imagination, with the last Romans on the fields of Philippi. Cotta. In the days of the decline of the Republic, my ancestors died with Brutus for liberty, but there is reason to suspect that what the Roman people called liberty was only, in reality, the right to govern themselves. I do not deny that liberty is the greatest boon a nation can have, but the longer I live, the more I am persuaded that only a strong government can bestow it on its citizens. For forty years I have filled high positions in the state, and my long experience has shown me that when the ruling power is weak, the people are oppressed. Those, therefore, who like the great majority of rhetoricians, try to weaken the government, commit an abominable crime. An autocrat who governs by his single will may sometimes cause most deplorable results. But if he governs by popular consent, there is no remedy possible. Before the majesty of the Roman arms had bestowed peace upon all the world, the only nations which were happy were those which were ruled over by intelligent despots. Hermodorus 
For my part, Lucius, I believed that there is no such thing as a good form of government, and that we shall never discover one, because the Greeks, who had so many excellent ideas, were never able to find one. In that respect, therefore, all hope of ultimate success is taken from us. Unmistakable signs show that the world is about to fall into ignorance and barbarism. It has been our lot, Lucius, to witness terrible events. Of all the mental satisfactions which intelligence, learning, and virtue can give, all that remains is the cruel pleasure of watching ourselves die. Cotta. It is true that the rapacity of people and the boldness of the barbarians are threatening evils, but with a good fleet and good army and plenty of money. Hermodorus, what is the use of deceiving ourselves? The dying empire will become an easy prey to the barbarians. Cities which were built by Hellenic genius or Latin patience will soon be sacked by drunken savages. Neither art nor philosophy will exist any longer on the earth. The statues of the gods will be overturned in the temples and in men's hearts as well. Darkness will overcome all minds and the world will die. Can we believe that the Sarmatians will ever devote themselves to intelligent work? That the Germani will cultivate music and philosophy? And that the Quadi and the Marcomani will adore the immortal gods? No! We are sliding toward the abyss. Our old Egypt, which was the cradle of the world, will be its burial vault. Serapis, the god of death, will receive the last adoration of mortals, and I shall have been the last priest of the last god. End of the Banquet, Section 1